Welcome to this POCUS Cardiac Tutorial. We will cover assessment of global left ventricular systolic function in this tutorial. Watch this on a laptop or desktop to access the associated reading material. This tutorial will take approximately 20 minutes. We will cover qualitative and quantitative methods used to assess the global left ventricular systolic function. Regional wall motion abnormalities are covered in a separate tutorial. The learning objectives are as follows. This video covers how to make a qualitative assessment of global LV systolic function. Additionally, three quantitative methods of LV systolic assessment are shown. These are fractional shortening, fractional area change and EPSS. Qualitative assessment of the LV involves eyeballing, or getting a visual estimate of LV systolic function. This is a commonly used method to determine LV function. It is usually quite easy to differentiate between a LV with good EF and one with severe systolic dysfunction. Eyeballing however becomes difficult when we are faced with left ventricles with mild or moderate dysfunction. It may be difficult to accurately grade these ventricles especially if one is new to echo. We can use several quantitative methods to better grade LV systolic function. These methods are straightforward to perform and have good reliability and reproducibility. Fractional shortening, fractional area change and EPSS will be described later in the video. We can first look at how to make a visual estimate of LV ejection fraction. This method is quick and easy. It is a reliable and recognized method to grade LV systolic function. Let's look at a few examples now. First, we have a left ventricle with normal ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is greater than 55%. We see the LV in the parasternal long axis view here. Only the anteroceptal and posteromedial LV walls are seen. The apex is usually not visualized here. This view can be used to obtain the measurements required for quantitative assessment of the LV. In the parasternal short axis view, the LV walls are seen to be contracting well. There is both adequate thickening and movement of the LV walls during systole. The LV cavity is seen to reduce in size by more than 50% during systole. Here, the anterior, lateral, septal and inferior walls can be seen together. In this view, the walls supplied by all three major coronary arteries can be imaged at the same time. There is equal wall thickening of all segments, and all regions of the LV move equally into the LV cavity during systole. There is no RWMA present and the EF is more than 50%. This is the short axis view of the mid-LV cavity. We should also image the apical and basal segments of the LV to get a global picture of LV systolic function. In the apical four-chamber view, we have the LV septal and lateral walls. The lateral wall is supplied by the circumflex artery whilst the septal wall is supplied by the RCA and LAD. The apical cap is supplied by the LAD. LV systolic function is normal here, and there is no RWMA. Next we can look at an example of a patient with moderate LV systolic dysfunction. In the parasternal long axis view, thickening and movement of the LV walls during systole is less compared to the previous case. This is an example of moderate LV systolic dysfunction. When making an assessment, we need to look at multiple views as well. Here we see the same patient's left ventricle in the short axis. Once again it is evident that wall movement and wall thickening is reduced. 
ejection fraction can be estimated at between 30 to 40 percent. Finally, we look at the LV in the apical four-chamber view. Once again, wall thickening and movement are noted to be reduced. The septal wall also appears hypokinetic in this echo clip. RWMA can be described as hypokinesia, akinesia, or dyskinesia. Akinesia refers to no thickening of the LV wall and no movement during systole. Dyskinesia refers to paradoxical outward movement of the LV wall. Let's look at a patient with severe LV systolic dysfunction next. The LV walls are very thin and hardly move or thicken in systole here. The LV cavity is dilated. Ejection fraction is significantly reduced. Here we see the mid-LV short axis view. Once again the walls appear thin and are hardly contracting. The LV cavity appears dilated. Ejection fraction can be estimated at no more than 20%. The apical four-chamber view reveals a dilated LV. Once again the LV walls are thin and hardly contract during systole. The EF is less than 20%. The lateral and septal LV walls are seen in this view. The apical cap is seen. When scanning in the apical four-chamber view, one must be aware of foreshortening. This would cause the LV to have a globular appearance as opposed to a more elliptical shape if the ultrasound plane cuts through the apex. We can grade EF as above. The normal LV has an EF greater than 50%, whilst severe systolic dysfunction is indicated by an EF less than 30%. Let's compare an LV with normal EF and one with moderate systolic dysfunction. The LV on the left contracts well. There is uniform wall thickening and wall movement during systole. All the walls contract well. The LV on the right contracts poorly. It has an EF of 30 to 35 percent. The echo clip on the left shows an end systolic area that is less than half the end diastolic area. This allows us to conclude that the EF is greater than 50 percent. The LV cavity on the right reduces by much less in systole. Next we can compare an LV with normal EF, echo clip on the left, with an LV with severe systolic dysfunction. The echo clip on the right shows a poorly contracting LV, EF is estimated at less than 20%. These are all views of the mid-LV cavity short axis. The mid portion of the LV is recognized by the presence of papillary muscles. Determining LV systolic function by eyeballing may not always be straightforward. There may be situations where the LV has mild systolic dysfunction, and it could be quite difficult to differentiate this from a normal LV by visual estimation alone. Several quantitative methods for LV systolic function determination are available. These are relatively easy to perform as part of a POCUS cardiac scan. Let's look at fractional shortening, fractional area change and EPSS. Fractional shortening. The measurements required to determine fractional shortening can be obtained in the parasternal long axis or parasternal short axis view. Either M mode or 2D measurements can be used.
In order to determine fractional shortening, we need to first measure the internal diameter of the LV in both diastole and systole. These are the LVID diastole and LVID systole measurements. Both measurements are seen here being made in diastole and systole in 2D mode. The measurements are being made in the parasternal long axis view. The red arrows show where the measurements of the LV diameter should be made. Here we have the same measurements of LV diameter being made in the parasternal short axis view. The image on the left shows diastole, while that on the right shows systole. We can also obtain these measurements with M mode, either in the parasternal long axis or parasternal short axis view as shown here. LVID diastole can be measured at the R wave of the ECG, while LVID systole can be measured where the LV cavity appears smallest. These are shown here. We can now calculate fractional shortening. This is the difference between end diastolic and end systolic diameters divided by the end diastolic diameter multiplied by 100%. Correlation between fractional shortening and EF is shown here. Fractional shortening between 25 to 43% indicates normal EF. A value less than 25% indicates abnormal EF. Let's now look at fractional area change. This is a similar concept to fractional shortening, except that area is used instead of diameter. Fractional area change is performed in the parasternal short axis view, at the mid-LV cavity level. The measurements required are LV and diastolic area and LV and systolic area. These are obtained as shown in the next clip. The image on the left shows LV and diastolic area being measured, while the image on the right shows measurement of LV and systolic area. Fractional area change is then determined by the difference between end diastolic area and end systolic area divided by end diastolic area multiplied by 100%. A fractional area change of less than 40% usually indicates LV systolic dysfunction. Finally, we will look at EPSS or E-point septal separation. This is another method of quantifying LV systolic function. This is a quick guide on how to obtain the EPSS measurement from the P-LAX view. EPSS refers to E-point septal separation. It is an easily obtained measurement that has been validated as a reliable surrogate for ejection fraction. M mode is used to obtain the EPSS measurement from the PLAX view. The M mode tracer is placed over the distal tip of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve as shown here. The mitral valve waveform on M mode contains two peaks. The first, larger peak is called the E point and corresponds to the maximal mitral valve opening in early LV diastole. The second, smaller peak is called the A point and corresponds to atrial contraction later in LV diastole. The E point and A point is labeled above. The distance between the interventricular septum and E point is used to determine EPSS. EPSS correlates negatively with LV ejection fraction. An EPSS of less than 8 mm indicates normal EF whilst an EPSS of greater than 13 mm is indicative of EF less than 